Other elements of basic composition include weight and gravity. This includes shapes that seem to float or sink based on their place in the composition as well as their solidity. Aaron Siskin's photograph from 1956 from his series The Pleasures and Terrors of Levitation. What we see here are three people seemingly floating in the sky. Undoubtedly, these were divers jumping off a diving board in, into a pool, but the way that Siskin photographed them, he excluded that detail. We don't see the pool. We don't see the diving board. We don't even see any features in the sky. We just see these people floating or falling in these blank white spaces. His title even amplifies the emotional impact that, that it could be both fun and horrifying at the same time. In Ed Bruchet's painting here, Start Over, Please, the light white words float, in a sense, over the landscape that we see in the background that appears to be some sort of sky. And when I say landscape, he's included a horizon line there that gives us a sense of depth and space. And so this may be, you know, at sunset as the you know, skies yellow and orange, and it gets darker and darker to the point that it's black. But by painting, simply start over, please. It floats on top of, and so it creates these spatial separations, but also adds weight. This line adds gravity. It brings everything down to that point, but these things float above it. Or in this Patrick Caulfield piece, the weight of the table at the bottom of the frame, it seems to sink. It seems naturally to fall to, towards the bottom. It's that sense of gravity. Then in a way, the bowl is rising up from that. And the little pieces of candy in the bowl are sort of punctuated pieces of color. Weight and gravity can also refer to the relative importance of a visual element within a design. And this is an example of that as well. The bowl is probably primary and the table secondary and then the background perhaps of third importance, if you will. Well, balance is varied visual elements working together to create a unified composition. Balance relies on an equality or equilibrium in size, weight, and presence of the objects that are depicted in the piece. One approach to balance is symmetry. Symmetry is a composition that is equal on two sides. Could be left and right or top and bottom. Or frankly, you could create a diagonal line from lower left to upper right in a rectangular format and use that as the line that separates. But anything that balances with two equal parts. Well, I see a typo here, but it's a Jerry Yulsman, not Jeru. But Jerry Yulsman's photograph here is a good example of symmetry. Yulsman is a photographic practitioner who uses the darkroom. While he's worked digitally, he's, his comfort zone is the darkroom, and essentially he uses the camera as a note-taking device. He goes out and makes photographs, but then composes them in the darkroom using multiple negatives and usually multiple enlargers. So he's printing in little pieces of one negative and other parts of another negative, etc. Well, you can see in his Apocalypse 2 piece here, what he's done in the background is photographed a tree and then created a negative rather than a positive of that tree. So maybe it suggests that apocalypse or a nuclear blast or something like that. But you can see that he's taken that negative and basically printed in this section and then flipped the negative upside down and then printed in this section so that they're the same. And you'll notice you see that with the mountains in the background as well. So that would be one negative, actually it would be a positive, and the people in the foreground is a separate negative, and my guess is the water in the foreground is a separate negative. So this is made up of at least three different negatives. But it's a good example of symmetry, where basically both sides, left and right, are equal. 
doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. You're going to see that in this Rose Wiley image. She's got two houses. They're very similar, but they're not exactly the same. But balancing, they play off of one another. They balance each other in essence. Well, one kind of symmetry is called radial symmetry. It's dividing the format horizontally and vertically into four equal parts rather than two. This Judy Chicago piece is a great example of that. You can read her title, Heaven is for White Men Only. The composition radiates from the center. And again, each four quadrants. So if you divided this piece by these lines here, we've got a quadrant in the upper left, another one in the upper right, same thing on the bottom, lower left and lower right. They may not be exactly the same. The colors in these lines vary a little bit, but they're so close to one another that they're really four equal parts. And that's what radial symmetry is, dividing horizontally and vertically into four equal sections that balance one another. Well, there's variations on radial symmetry, and I'm not going to illustrate all of these. I'll give you one example. But centrifugal balance is visual forces that expand outward, that start in the center and move out towards the edges of the format. Centripetal balance is visual forces expanding inward. They start from the edges and move towards the center. Or concentric balance is essentially the bullseye effect, and you see that here with Jasper John's target painting from 1958, where everything radiates from the edge into that center and back. The ride keeps moving in and out, forward and backward. Well, asymmetry, simply put, is not symmetrical. Asymmetry is balance created between visual elements of different sizes, weights, textures, and or colors. Frankly, most compositions, not all, but most compositions are asymmetrical. This Piet Mondrian painting, you can see, is an example of that. He's loosely divided this into an uneven grid, and he's used primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. But they're not in equal parts. They are unbalanced in that sense. But visually, they tend to balance themselves out. They seem to be unified. This Henri Rousseau painting is another example of asymmetrical balance. Notice there's no symmetry. You can't divide this down the center, either horizontally or vertically. It's not divided into four equal parts. But it plays one shape, one color, one tone, one line off another. And it's a great example of asymmetrical balance. Generally speaking, when people appear in compositions, they become primary focal points. And you see that. Our eye probably goes right to the nude here. But then she's seemingly pointing. And then there's another person here. And then we see some of the flora and fauna. And again, we have all these concentric lines that add energy and detail, etc., running throughout. And our eye, our eye moves throughout this frame. But it doesn't concentrate on the middle. It doesn't radiate from the edge to the center or from the center out. It seems balanced, but in an asymmetrical manner. I love here, too, how he's used the sun or the moon here. And that's a subtle little thing, but it activates that space. If you thought of this as just being that blue, like we see in some of these other places here, it would give a certain kind of space and an opening that we don't otherwise have. This is a closed composition, meaning we don't have this sense of great depth. We don't have a really distinct background horizon line. And so what we have are all these active little areas of space, of accents and punctuation marks and little surprising details in this very dense composition. Other techniques of two-dimensional composition 
are scale and proportion. Proportion is the relative size of visual elements within a composition, how they relate to each other. Are some bigger or smaller, or are they the same size? Scale is the size of a sh shape or object in relation to normal human dimensions. I'll show you some examples. This Lind Ward woodcut that you see here. Lind Ward was an illustrator. He did illustrations for books and magazines in particular. He did a number of his own woodcut novels that he did in the 1930s. They're really interesting pieces where there's no words other than the title, and they're usually about 200 pages, and each page is, a, uh, is an image, and the images tell a story, and you can kind of get the sense here that this is part of a narrative. But look at how he's used scale and proportion here, where the scale of the person in the foreground compared to the factories and the smokestacks in the background and even the clouds. The man here looks monumental in size compared to the other elements in the background, but it's a way to emphasize his importance in this composition. Or in this Max Ernst painting, the surrealist, he exaggerates proportions so that they stand out in this strange being that he has created here, that if you look carefully, looks like it's made up of a few different kinds of beings. And you can see again that he's got the horizon line in the background to give us a sense of space and scale. And we even have some mountains in the background that look like they're dwarfed by the huge scale of this anthropomorphic being in the foreground. Exaggerating the proportions allows to create these dramatic effects. Emphasis gives part of a design prominence over other parts of that same composition. Emphasis can be design elements such as color, size, texture, etc. that draws attention to that element. This Roy Lichtenstein painting that you see here, he's painted a brushstroke in essence. He's defined a brushstroke and we have that energy of the movement of this kind of swash of line there is applied to a surface, in this case, a surface of half-tone dots. Emphasis is essentially something that disrupts the flow of the other elements. So he's created a pattern in the background with these dots, and then in the foreground, this brush mark interrupts that pattern, and it becomes a focal point and recognizable because of that interruption, because it's different, it stands out. Well, in this 60s poster that you see of the Beatles when they came to Shea Stadium in New York, emphasis is created partly by color, having yellow on the top against that more sort of pinkish background. Not only do, when people appear in images, do they become focal points, but so do words. And even if it's a word in another language and we can't necessarily read it or understand it, we still recognize it as some sort of human element and it gives us something to connect with. Humans and words, they're not equal in pictures, but indeed they both generally become focal points. And certainly the graphic designer who did this piece recognized that. While they're not really trying to create art, this is really more about marketing in some ways, but design works in both facets. Well, this is one of my photographs that I did a number of years ago. I took this photograph in New Mexico, and I should tell you when I was uh, making this picture, I was actually photographing some other things in a field, and I was looking through my camera, and, but I heard something that in the distance and I realized there's a couple of horses running right at me and so I kind of put my camera down and I was right next to a fence so I kind of backed up against the fence well indeed the horses come running right up to me they were really just friendly and curious and probably thought maybe I had something for them to eat which I didn't but they just stood there and looked at me so I included them in my photograph well indeed the fact that they're horses and even though you just see the top parts of their head here 
we identify more with horses than we do with mountains or clouds or those kinds of things. And so be, they become immediate focal points because of their subject. Also, their placement at the bottom of the frame and more or less in the middle of the bottom of the frame emphasizes their importance. And I should point out, I was trying to sort of play the pair of horses off of those two clouds so that related in that sense as well. An anomaly within a visual image makes that anomaly stand out. Separation and connection, it's a break in a pattern that stands out and accentuates that it separates from that pattern. This Frida Kahlo piece, the Henry Ford Hospital from 1932. If you look at the background first, for example, you'll see the ground, the bottom, the brown. Then we have a horizon line with a city, with an industrial looking city there in the background. Well, in the middle ground or foreground, we see Kahlo herself lying in the bed. Well, the bed itself disrupts the smooth texture and pattern of the sky and the ground. And then she has these floating figures that seem connected via umbilical cords or something similar. Again, each one of those becomes a focal point. It disrupts the surface or the other information. So we have the fetus and the snail, but the background, they don't blend in with the background, they stand out, as do these elements here in the background. Well, they're all tied, in a way, almost physically, back to the model. But the fact that they exist in these areas where they stand out because they're different is what separation and connection is all about. One of my better friends, Steve Fitch, photographer who lives outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, he's really for years been photographing homemade advertisement signs that people basically paint on plywood and put along the side of the road like a billboard. So he's been documenting those. But again, the background here suggests a typical New Mexico landscape. And you see kind of this scrubby terrain and some mountains here and there in the background. I love how Fitch took the horizon line in the background and lined it up with the horizon line that you see of the mountains in the sign itself. So there's a kind of separation and connection. But also here, the fact that it stands out, it's different. It's these human marks on a piece of board in what's otherwise more or less a natural terrain. The billboard is different and it stands out because of that. Location is the placement of a design element that can draw attention to it. it can be like this on Barnett Newman's painting here where he uses the red line a little off-center here, but then using red lines against this background on one edge and then the, the other side, that it balances those shapes out. So simply the location, and I would argue the color, makes those stand out. Contrast is when two or more elements or forces work in opposition to one another. Milton Glaser, who sadly just passed away, did this poster for Columbia Records that went inside one of the Bob Dylan albums. Notice this approach here to simplify where the portrait of Dylan becomes a silhouette and he's using the stark contrast between the black of the figure and the white of the background. I would argue that the way he's used this background shape, it becomes sort of both a play on positive and negative space. Again, positive space that protrudes or pops out, negative space recedes. Well, in addition to that contrast, which is a contrast in value, basically we have these featureless tones of white and black here. Then we have these contour lines that are filled in with bright colors. So we have a color contrast here going on as well. In addition, 
there's the texture created by those contour lines. We have no texture in other parts of that image. So it's looking at forces that play off of one another to balance each other. A yin and a yang, a positive and negative. I'm going to show you a few images here by the New Mexico artist Holly Roberts. There's various ways that we can approach contrast in a work, and I found examples for all of her works. Size is one of the areas in which we can create contrast. Notice that in this piece we have this tiny little swimmer here hooked up to or maybe pulling and saving the people in the boat who are larger in scale and certainly the boat is bigger in scale. So we have kind of the presence of this little figure struggling to pull this great big boat with the bigger people. It's a play on scale and it seems to make this effort even more heroic. Or playing shapes off of one another, the contrast in shapes. Here we have the human wolf form on the right hand side that seems very organic. And then on the left hand side we have this small little house. So she's also playing size here where the wolf is much bigger than the house. And it, plays off of one another that way, but even more importantly, she's playing off essentially organic versus geometric shapes. So it's the shape that's part of the contrast. Or color can be the contrast, and you see that in this work. And I should tell you her process. She uses photographs, which she essentially collages, Sometimes she's painting on top of the photograph. Sometimes the photograph sits on top of a painting, but she combines her media here. So they are essentially painted, photographed collages. The color contrast, you can see to the rule of thirds where she's essentially divided her format into three equal parts, the top, the middle, and the bottom. And there's an overlap there between them, where you can see the legs of the horse connect to the brown part of the bottom, but the girl that's become part of that horse is connected to the top part, and again, transcribes across the middle part of that image. But more importantly, the color contrast of the pink and green contrasting to the brown in the foreground. She's using colors on different parts of the color wheel. Well, another way to achieve contrast is through texture. And you can see that she's done that in this collage as well. She's created this portrait of a beautiful woman, but that beautiful woman, if you look carefully, the texture of her face looks like it's probably asphalt or something similar to that. I love, too, the creative She's using trees as hair. So it's sort of suggesting a connection between humans and nature. 